3. It is not unnatural that the best writers are liars. A major part of their trade is to lie or invent, and they will lie when they are drunk, or to themselves, or to strangers. Ernest Hemingway Chapter 1 At this point, I suppose, like that poor bastard harangued by the ancient mariner, forced to endure his weird tale, you must be wondering what the hell you let yourself in for, agreeing to hear my story. It only gets weirder, I'm afraid. I wish I knew how you felt about me right now. Are you slightly charmed, even beguiled, as Lana used to be? Or like Kate, do you find me irritating, self-dramatizing, self-indulgent? All of the above is probably closest to the truth. But we like to keep moral questions simple, don't we? Good, bad, innocent, guilty. That's fine in fiction. Real life is not so clear-cut. Human beings are complex creatures, with shades of light and dark operating in all of us. If this sounds like I'm trying to justify myself, I assure you I'm not. I am well aware that as we proceed, and you hear the rest of this tale, you might not approve of my actions. That's fine. I don't seek your approval. What I seek, no, what I demand, is your understanding. Otherwise, my story will never touch your heart. It will remain a two-a-penny thriller, that you might pick up at an airport to devour on a beach, only to discard, forgotten, by the time you get home. I will not allow my life to be reduced to pulp. No, sir. If you are to understand what follows, if any of the incredible events I'm about to relate are to make any sense to you, I must explain some things about myself. Some things I felt I couldn't reveal to you when we first met. Why not? I wanted you to get to know me a little better, I suppose. I hoped you might then excuse some of my less attractive traits. But now, it has overtaken me, this desire to unburden myself. I couldn't stop now, even if I wanted to. Like the ancient mariner, I need to get it off my chest. I must warn you, what follows is, at times, hard to take. It's certainly hard to write about. If you thought Lana's murder was the climax of this sordid tale, you were sadly mistaken. The real horror is yet to come. Once again, I must turn back the clock. Not to the Soho Street in London this time, but much, much further. I will tell you about Lana and me, about our friendship, strange and extraordinary thing that it was. But that's just the tip of the iceberg, to be frank. My relationship with Lana Farr began a long time before we ever met. It began when I was someone else. Chapter 2 It's funny. Whenever the novelist Christopher Isherwood would write about his younger self, it was always in the third person. He would write about him, a kid named Christopher. Why? Because, I think, it allowed him to access empathy for himself. It's so much easier to feel empathy for other people, isn't it? If you see a scared little boy on the street, bullied, shamed, disrespected by an abusive parent, you instantly feel sympathy for him. But in the case of our own childhoods, it's hard to see so clearly. Our perception is clouded by the need to comply, justify, and forgive. It takes an impartial outsider sometimes, like a skilled therapist, to help us see the truth. That as kids, we were alone and afraid in a frightening place. And no one took any notice of our pain. We couldn't admit this to ourselves back then. It was too scary. So we swept it under an enormous carpet, hoping it would go away. But it didn't. It remained there, lingering forever, like nuclear waste. High time, don't you think, to lift up the rug and take a good look? Although, for safety's sake, I shall borrow Christopher Isherwood's technique. What follows is the kid's story, not mine. The kid's early years were not happy. Having a child was no doubt an inconvenience to his parents, a failed experiment, never to be repeated. They provided him with food and shelter, but gave him precious little else, apart from occasional lessons in drunkenness and brutality. Home was bad. School was worse. The kid wasn't popular. He wasn't sporty or cool or clever. He was shy and withdrawn and lonely. The only classmates who spoke to him with any regularity were the bullies, a gang of four mean boys in his class. He nicknamed them the Neanderthals. The Neanderthals would wait for the kid every morning by the school gates and empty his pockets, taking his lunch money, shoving him, tripping him up, and playing other pranks. They had a fondness for kicking footballs at his head, attempting to knock him over, while hurling insults at him like weirdo and freak, or worse. 
and when he was face down in the dirt, there was always, behind his back, a chorus of laughter. High-pitched children's laughter, jeering and malevolent. I read somewhere that laughter is evil in origin, as it requires an object of ridicule, a butt, a fool. A bully is never the butt of his own jokes, is he? The leader of the Neanderthals was a real joker, called Paul. He was popular, in that way mean kids can be. He was a wag, a prankster. He sat at the back of the class, mocking teachers and students alike, demonstrating a precocious grasp of psychological warfare. Paul decided that none of his classmates were allowed to speak to the kid. He was deemed a leper, too disgusting, too gross, too smelly, and too damn weird to be talked to, acknowledged, or touched. He must be avoided at any cost. From then on, girls would delight in running off in fits of excited giggles and screams if the kid neared them on the playground. Boys would pull faces and make retching noises if they passed him on the stairs. Cruel notes, wishing him harm, were left in his desk for him to find. And always, behind his back, that high-pitched, mocking laughter. There were occasional respites from this misery. When he was twelve years old, he was in a play for the first time. A school production of that glorious old American war horse, Our Town, by Thornton Wilder. Possibly an odd choice of play for a comprehensive school outside London, but his drama teacher, Cassandra, hailed from the United States. She was probably homesick when she decided to stage this love letter to small-town America in Basildon, Essex. The kid liked Cassandra. She had a friendly horse face and wore a necklace of amber beads with prehistoric flies trapped in them. She gave him some of the closest moments he had ever known to happiness. She cast him, presumably without irony, as Simon Stimson, a cynical alcoholic choir master who ends up hanging himself. The kid relished the part to the full. As existential angst, sarcasm, despair, he had no idea what his lines meant literally, but trust me, he got the gist. That first night of the performance, the kid experienced a pause for the first time in his life. He'd never known anything like it. It felt like a wave of affection, of love, flooding the stage, drenching him. The kid shut his eyes and drank it in. But then he opened his eyes and saw Paul and the other Neanderthals sitting in the back row, laughing, making faces and obscene gestures. Their eventual expressions told him there would be a price to pay for his brief moment of happiness. He didn't have to wait long. The following morning, at break time, he was dragged into the boys' locker room. He was told he was going to be punished for showing off, for thinking he was special. One Neanderthal stood guard by the door, making sure they weren't disturbed. The other two pushed the kid down, onto his knees, and held him there, by the stinking urinal. Paul reached into his locker. He produced, with a magician's flourish, a large carton of milk. I've been saving this for weeks, he said, brewing it for a special occasion. He opened the carton slightly, cautiously sniffing it, then pulled a disgusted face like he might throw up. The other boys tittered in anticipation. Get ready, said Paul. He ripped open the carton, and he was about to turn it upside down over the kid's head when he suddenly had a better idea. He held the carton out to the kid. You do it. The kid shook his head, trying not to cry. No, please, no, please. It's your punishment. Do it. No, do it. I wish I could say the kid fought back, but he didn't. He took hold of the carton that was being thrust into his hands, and slowly, ceremoniously, under Paul's supervision, the kid poured the contents over his head. Rotten milk, white, sludgy, green, foul-smelling slime slid down his face, covering his eyes, filling his mouth. He gagged on it. He could hear the boys laughing, shrieking. Their side-splitting laughter was almost as cruel as the punishment itself. Nothing can be worse than this, he thought. The shame, the humiliation, the anger bubbling inside. Nothing could ever be as bad. He was wrong, of course. He had so much farther to fall. Writing this, I feel such anger, such outrage on his behalf. Even though it's too late, and even though it's only me, I'm glad someone is at last empathizing with him. No one else did, least of all himself. Heraclitus was right, you see. Character is fate. Other children who had more successful childhoods, brought up to respect and stand up for themselves, might have fought back, or at least alerted the authorities. But in the kid's case, sadly, every time he took a beating, he felt he deserved it. He started skipping school after that. 
He'd hang around alone in town, at the mall, or sneak into the movies. And it was there, in the dark, he first encountered Lana Farr. Lana was only a few years older than him, barely more than a child herself. It was one of Lana's first films he saw, Starstruck, an early misfire, an unfunny romantic comedy about a movie starlet falling in love with a paparazzo, played by an actor old enough to be her father. The kid was oblivious of all the sexist jokes and contrived comic situations. All he could see was her. Those eyes, that face, projected up on the screen, thirty feet high. The loveliest face he'd ever seen. As every cinematographer who worked with her discovered, Lana had no bad angles. Just perfect planes, the face of a Greek goddess. She cast a spell on the kid in that moment. He never recovered. He kept going back to the cinema just to see her, just to gaze at her. He saw every film she made, and God knows she churned them out in those early days. Their variable quality was of little interest to him. He happily watched them all, again and again. The kid was at his lowest ebb when he encountered Lana. He was close to despair, and she gave him beauty. She gave him joy. It wasn't much, perhaps, but it was enough to sustain him, to keep him alive. He would sit alone in the middle of the movie theater, in the fifteenth row, and gaze at Lana in the dark. No one could see it, but there was a smile on his face. Chapter 3 Nothing lasts forever, not even in a happy childhood. The years passed, and the kid grew older. As he grew, a flood of hormones signaled growth spurts in all kinds of peculiar places. The need to shave was something he agonized over for months. He'd stare despondently at his ever-increasing beard in the mirror, dimly aware that learning to shave was some kind of ancient masculine rite of passage, a bonding moment between father and son, initiating the boy into manhood. The thought of sharing that rite with his own father made him feel physically sick. The kid decided to circumnavigate embarrassment by sneaking off to the corner shop and buying razors and shaving foam, which he kept hidden like porn in his bedside drawer. He permitted himself one question to his father, He felt it was innocuous enough. "'How do you not cut yourself?' he said casually. "'When you're shaving, I mean. Do you make sure the razor is not too sharp?' His father threw him a look of contempt. "'It's a blunt razor that cuts you, idiot, not a sharp one.' That ended their conversation. So, with no other recourse, in that pre-internet age, the kid smuggled the foam and razors into the bathroom. Through trial and bloody error, he taught himself how to be a man. He left home soon after that. He ran away, a few days after his 17th birthday. He went to London, like Dick Whittington, in search of fame and fortune. The kid wanted to be an actor. He assumed all he had to do was appear at one of the catacall auditions advertising the back pages of the stage, and he would be discovered and catapulted into stardom. It didn't quite work out like that. Easy to see why, looking back, never mind that he wasn't a very good actor. Too self-conscious and too unnatural. He wasn't handsome enough to stand out in the crowd. He had a ragamuffin look, more unkempt with each passing day. Not that he could see it at the time. If he had, he might have swallowed his pride, gone home with his tail between his legs, and come to much less grief. As it was, the kid reassured himself success was just around the corner. He just had to tough it out for a while longer, that's all. Unfortunately, he soon ran out of what little money he had. He was now penniless and kicked out of the youth hostel in King's Cross where he'd been staying. And that's when things got really bad, really fast. You wouldn't think it, now it's gentrified and cleaned up, all gleaming steel and exposed brick. But back then, my god, King's Cross was rough. A shadowy place full of danger, a Dickensian underworld populated by drug dealers, prostitutes, and homeless kids. It makes me shudder now to think of him there, alone, so spectacularly ill-equipped to survive. He was now destitute and sleeping on benches and parks until his luck changed during a rainstorm when he found refuge in Euston Cemetery. He climbed over the wall into the graveyard, looking for shelter. He discovered, along one side of the church, a subterranean bunker, a dugout concrete space big enough for two or three people to lie down comfortably. Well, as comfortable as you can get in an empty crib, for that's what it was. But it provided a level of protection. For the kid, it was a minor miracle. He was a little unhinged by this point. He was hungry, scared, paranoid, and increasingly cut off from the world. He felt dirty, 
like he stank. He probably did. And he didn't like getting too close to people. But he was desperate, so he did some things for money that he... No, I can't bring myself to write about that. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be coy. I'm sure you have a few things you'd rather not tell me about. We all have a skeleton or two in our closet, so to speak. Let this be mine. The first time he did it, he felt entirely disassociated and blanked it out, as if it were happening to someone else. The second time, it was much worse. So he shut his eyes and thought of the mad woman who lived on the church steps, shouting at passerbys to fling themselves into the arms of Jesus. He imagined throwing himself into Jesus' arms and being saved. But somehow, salvation felt a long way off. Afterward, feeling overwhelmed and afraid, the kid sat up all night until dawn, clutching a cup of coffee in Houston Station, trying not to think, trying not to feel. He sat there through the early morning rush hour, a depressed waif ignored by the sea of commuters. He counted the minutes until the pubs opened, and he could get a drink. Finally, the dingy pub across the road opened its doors, offering sanctuary for the lost and disheartened. The kid went inside and sat at the bar. He paid cash for a vodka. It was the first time he had ever tasted vodka, come to think of it. He knocked it back, wincing as it burned his throat. Then he heard a husky voice at the end of the bar. What's a pretty thing like you doing in a shithole like this? This was, on reflection, the first and last compliment she ever paid him. The kid looked up, and there was Barbara West, a lined older woman, dyed red hair, an excess of mascara. She had the darkest, most piercing eyes he had ever seen, penetrating, brilliant, and scary. Barbara laughed, a distinctive laugh, a throaty cackle. She laughed easily, he discovered, mostly at her own jokes. The kid would grow to hate her laugh. But that day, he merely felt indifferent. He shrugged and tapped his empty glass in answer to her question. What's it look like? Barbara took the hint, nodding at the barman. Give him another, Mike. Me too, while you're at it. Doubles. Barbara had gone to the pub that morning direct from signing books in the Waterstones bookshop next door, because she was an alcoholic. Character is fate, and without Barbara's need for a gin and tonic at 11 a.m., she and the kid would never have met. They were from two different worlds, those two, and were destined in the end only to cause each other harm. They had a couple more drinks. Barbara kept her eyes on him the whole time, sizing him up. She liked what she saw. After one more drink for the road, she called a cab. She took the kid home with her. It was only meant to be for one night, but one night led to another and another, and he never left. Yes, Barbara West used him, taking advantage of this desperate child in his hour of need. She was indeed a predator, even if, unlike her alcoholism, this was not immediately apparent. She was one of the darkest human beings I ever encountered. I dread to think what she would have done with her life if she hadn't had a knack for writing novels. But let's not underestimate the kid here. He understood perfectly well what he was getting into. He knew what Barbara wanted, and he was happy to supply it. If anything, he got the better deal. In return for his services, he received not only a roof over his head, but an education, which he needed just as urgently. In that house in Holland Park, he had access to a private library, a world full of books. Can I read one? he said, staring at them in awe. Barbara seemed surprised at his request. Perhaps she doubted he could read. Take your pick, she shrugged. He randomly chose one book from the shelf. Hard times. Oh, yuck, Dickens. Barbara pulled a face. So sentimental. Still, I suppose you've got to start somewhere. But the kid didn't find Dickens sentimental. He found him wonderfully entertaining, and funny, and profound. So he read David Copperfield next, and his enjoyment grew, along with his appetite. Not just for Dickens, but for whatever he could find on Barbara's shelves, devouring all the great authors he could lay his hands on. Every day spent in that house was an education, not just from her books, but from Barbara herself, and from the circle she moved in, the literary salon she ran from her living room. As time went on, and the kid was exposed to more and more of her life, he kept his eyes and ears open. He tried to absorb as much as he could from her guests' conversations, what all these sophisticated people said and how they said it. He would memorize phrases and opinions and gestures, practicing them when he was alone, in front of a mirror, trying them on, like uncomfortable clothes he was determined to squeeze into. 
Don't forget the kid was an aspiring actor, and frankly, this was his only role, which he tirelessly and meticulously rehearsed over the years until he honed it to perfection. Then, one day, staring at himself in the mirror, he could see no trace of the kid. Someone else was staring back at him. But who was this new person? The first thing he had to do was find a name for him. He stole one from a play on Barbara's shelf, from Private Lives, by Noel Coward. Barbara thought this was hilarious, of course, but despite mocking him, she went along with it. She preferred this new name, she said, as it was less hideous than his real one. But between you and me, I think the idea just appealed to her sense of the perverse. That evening, over a bottle of champagne, he was christened Elliot Chase. I was born. And then, with perfect timing, Lana appeared. Chapter 4 I've forgotten many things in my inebriated life. Numberless names and faces, places I've been, whole cities, have fallen into a void in my mind. But something that I will never forget until I die, forever emblazoned in my mind, engraved upon my heart, is the moment I first met Lana Farr. Barbara West and I had gone to see Kate in a play. It was a new translation of Hedda Gabler at the National. It was the first night, and though the production was a pretentious stinker, in my humble opinion, it was received with wild acclaim and heralded as a triumph. There was a first night party afterward, which Barbara begrudgingly agreed to attend. Any unwillingness on her part was pure bullshit, believe me. If there was free booze and free food on offer, Barbara was always the first in line, especially at a party of lovey theatricals, who would queue up to tell her how much her writing meant to them, and generally kiss her ass. She loved that, as you can imagine. Anyway, I was standing next to her, bored to death, concealing a yawn, idly casting my gaze over a motley crew of actors and wannabe actors, producers, journalists, and so on. Then, I noticed, across the room, a large group of people, admirers and hangers-on, gathering around someone, a woman, judging by the glimpse I caught through the jostling crowd. I craned my neck to see who it was, but her face kept being obscured by the shifting bodies surrounding her. Finally, someone moved, a gap was created, and I caught a momentary flash of her face. I couldn't believe my eyes. Was it really her? Surely not. I craned my neck to get a better look but I didn't need one. It was her. Feeling excited, I turned and nudged Barbara. She was mid-lecture to an unhappy-looking playwright about why he wasn't more commercially successful. Barbara? Barbara waved away my attention. I'm talking, Elliot. Over there, look. It's Lana Farr. She grunted. So? So, you know her, don't you? We've met once or twice. Introduce me to her. Certainly not. Go on, please. I looked at Barbara, hopefully. She smiled. Nothing gratified Barbara more than refusing a heartfelt request. I don't think so, duck. Why not? Yours not to reason why. Go and get me another drink. Get your own fucking drink. In a rare act of rebellion, I left her. I knew she'd be furious and make me pay for it later, but I didn't care. I walked across the room, straight up to Lana. Time seemed to slow down as I approached her. I felt as if I were departing reality, entering a heightened state. I must have pushed my way through the crowd. I don't remember. I was oblivious to everyone but her. I found myself there in the inner circle, standing to one side of her. I stared at her, starstruck, while she listened politely to some men talking. But she couldn't fail to notice me standing there. She glanced at me. I love you, I said. These were the first words I ever said to Lana Farr. The people around her were all startled. They bust out laughing. Thankfully, Lana also laughed. I love you too. And that's how it began. We kept talking all night, meaning I successfully fended off interruptions from would-be competitors. I made her laugh, making fun of the overall production we had just been forced to endure. I let it slip that Kate was a mutual friend, a discovery that made Lana visibly relax in my company. Even so, I had my work cut out for me. I had to convince Lana I wasn't some weirdo, or obsessive fan, or potential stalker. I had to persuade her I was an equal, at least in intellect, if not in fame or fortune. I badly wanted to impress her. I needed her to like me. Why? I don't think I knew myself, to be honest. Dimly, subconsciously, I wanted to keep hold of her. 
Even then, it seems, I couldn't bear to let her go. Lana was cautious at first, but receptive to my conversation. Now, I'm not quick-witted at the best of times. I can supply you with a witty repost, but only if you give me three days to write it. However, that night, miraculously, the stars all aligned in my favor. For once, my shyness didn't get the better of me. On the contrary, I was confident, lucid, lubricated with just the right amount of wine, and I found myself talking intelligently, entertainingly, even wittily, on a variety of subjects. I talked knowledgeably about the theater, for instance, about plays that were currently on, what was coming, and recommended a couple of lesser-known productions to Lana that I said were worth seeing, and I suggested some exhibitions and galleries that she hadn't heard of. In other words, I gave a completely convincing performance of the person I had always wanted to be. A confident, sophisticated, razor-sharp man about town. That's the man I saw reflected in Lana's eyes. In her eyes, that night, I shone. Barbara West eventually gave in and joined us, all smiles, greeting Lana as an old friend. Lana was perfectly civil to Barbara, but I got the sense that Lana didn't like her, which was entirely in Lana's favor. When Barbara went to the bathroom, leaving us alone, Lana took the opportunity to inquire about our relationship. Are you a couple? I must confess to being a little evasive. I said I was Barbara's partner and left it at that. I understood why Lana was asking. She was single when we met, you see. Jason had yet to come on the scene. I suspected Lana was making sure she was safe with me, determining that I was someone else's property, and therefore less likely to pounce or make any sudden moves. I imagine she got a lot of that. By the end of the night, we agreed to meet again on Sunday for a walk along the river. I asked for Lana's number when Barbara wasn't looking. To my utter joy, she gave it to me. As Barbara and I left the party that night, I couldn't stop smiling. I felt as if I were walking on air. Barbara, on the other hand, was in a foul mood. What a shitty production. I gave it three weeks before they put it out of its misery. Oh, I don't know. I glanced at the poster of Kate as Hedda Gabler holding up a pistol. I smiled. I had a pretty good time. Barbara shot me a poisonous look. Yes, I know you did. I saw. She didn't comment further, for the moment. Barbara waited a long time to make me pay for my insolent behavior that evening. But she made me pay in the end, as you will see. Oh yes, she made me pay dearly. Chapter 5 It's hard for me to write about my friendship with Lana. There is too much to say. How can I possibly describe, in a series of well-chosen vignettes, the slow and complicated process of the bond of trust and affection between us. Perhaps I should select a single moment from our years together, as you might pick a random card from a deck in a magic trick, to conjure up the merest feeling of what it was like. Why not? In which case, I choose our very first walk together, a Sunday afternoon in late May. It explains everything, about what came later, I mean, and how two people who were so close in every regard could, in the end, misunderstand each other so completely. We met up on the south bank for a walk along the Thames. I turned up with a red rose that I had bought from the stall outside the station. I could tell at once, from Lana's expression when I presented the rose to her, that this was a mistake. I hope this doesn't mean we're starting off on the wrong foot, she said. Which foot is that? I said stupidly. Left or right? Lana smiled and let it go at that. But that wasn't the end of it. We walked for a while, then we sat outside a pub on a beach along the river. We each had a glass of wine. We sat there in silence for a moment. Lana played with the rose in her fingers. Finally, she spoke. Does Barbara know you're here? Barbara? I shook my head. I assure you, she takes very little interest in my comings and goings. Why? Lana shrugged. I was just curious. Were you afraid she might come too? I laughed. Do you think Barbara's spying on us now from behind those bushes, with a pair of binoculars and a gun? I wouldn't put it past her. Lana laughed. Her laugh, so familiar to me from her films, made me grin. Don't worry, I said. You have me all to yourself. That was clumsy. I cringe now, remembering it. Lana smiled but didn't reply. She toyed with the rose for a moment. Then she held it up and tilted her head to look at the rose and me at the same time. And this, what does this mean? Nothing. It's just a rose. 
Does Barbara know you bought me a rose? I laughed. Of course not. It doesn't mean anything. It's just a flower. I'm sorry it made you uncomfortable. It's not that. She looked away for a moment. It doesn't matter. Shall we go? We finished our wine and left the pub. We continued strolling along the Thames. As we walked, Lana glanced at me, then said quietly, I can't give you what you want, you know. I can't give you what you're looking for. I smiled, even though I was nervous. What am I looking for? You mean friendship? I'm not looking for anything. Lana half smiled. Yes, you are, Elliot. You're looking for love. Anyone can see that. I could feel my cheeks reddening. I looked away in embarrassment. Lana tactfully moved the conversation on. We neared the end of our walk. And that was that. With the lightest of touches, Lana had firmly and politely let me know that she did not think of me as a potential lover. She had dispatched me to the realm of friendship. Or so I thought at the time. Looking back now, I'm not so sure. So much of how I interpreted that moment was colored by my past, and who I thought I was, and the distorted lens through which I viewed the world. I felt so convinced of my undesirability, if that's even a word. It's how I'd felt ever since I was a kid. Ugly, unattractive, unwanted. But what if, for one second, I had put down my self-obsessed emotional baggage that I insisted on caring about with me? What if I had actually listened to what Lana was saying? Well, then I might have discovered that her words had little to do with me and everything to do with her. With the benefit of hindsight, I can hear what Lana was saying. She was saying she was sad, she was lost, and she was lonely, or she would never have been sitting there with me, a relative stranger, on a Sunday afternoon. When she accused me of wanting love, what she really meant was that I wanted to be saved. I can't save you, Elliot, Lana was saying, not when I need saving myself. If I had realized this at the time, if I hadn't been so blind, so fearful, if I'd had more courage, well, I might have acted very differently in that moment. And then, perhaps, his story would have had a happier ending. Chapter 6 From then on, I began to accompany Lana on her walks around London. We'd walk for hours and spend many afternoons crossing bridges, trudging along canals, roaming through parks, discovering old and peculiar pubs tucked in, around, and sometimes even under the city. I often think about those walks, about all the things we talked about and the things we didn't. All the things that were skirted over, ignored, dismissed. The things I'd failed to notice. I said to you earlier that Lana always saw the best in you, making you rise to the challenge and try to be that person, embody the best possible version of yourself. Well, it was true of her, too. Lana was trying to be the person I wanted her to be. I can see that now. Both of us performing for each other. It makes me so sad to write that. Sometimes I look back and wonder if that's all it ever was, a performance. But no, that's not fair. It was real enough, deep down. In her own way, Lana was as much a fugitive from her past as I was. Or, to put it less poetically, just as fucked up. Isn't that what brought us together in the first place? What connected us? The fact we were both so lost? I couldn't see any of this back then. My omniscience is entirely retrospective. I sit here now, knowing what I know, and peer into the past, trying to see the end in the beginning, and piece together all the hidden clues and signs I missed then, when I was young and in love and starstruck. The truth is, I didn't want to see the sad, wounded woman walking by my side. The damaged, frightened person. I was far more invested in her performance and the masks she wore. I'd squint a little as I gazed at Lana, so I wouldn't see the cracks in it. Sometimes, as we walked, I'd asked Lana about her old movies. She was so quick to dismiss them. I'll admit it rather hurt my feelings. All these films I cherished and had seen so many times. You made a lot of people happy, including me. You should be proud of that. Lana shrugged. I don't know about that. I do. I was a fan. That's as far as I went. I didn't want to make her uncomfortable. I didn't want to reveal the extent of my... My what? Let's be kind. Let's not call it obsession. Let's call it love, for that's what it was. And so, we became friends. But were we ever just friends, really? I'm not so sure. Even a man as... I'm struggling for inoffensive adjectives here. Unthreatening, unmanly, as timid as myself, is not immune to beauty. 
to desire. Wasn't there an unacknowledged tension between us even then? It was so subtle, a gossamer thin frizzin, a whisper of sexuality. But it was there, hanging like a spider's web in the air around us. The closer Lana and I became, the less time we spent outside. We spent most of our time at her house, that huge six-story mansion in Mayfair. God, I miss that house. Just the smell of it, the fragrance upon entering the doorway. I used to pause in the vast hallway, shut my eyes, and breathe it, drink it in. Smell is so evocative, isn't it? It's similar to taste. Both senses are time machines, transporting you, beyond your control, against your will, even, to somewhere in your past. Nowadays, if I sniff a bottle of polished wood or cold stone, I'm right back there, in that house, with its scent of chilly Venetian marble, polished dark oak, lilies, lilac, sandalwood incense, and feel such a burst of contentment, a warm glow in my heart. If I could bottle that smell and sell it, I'd make a bloody fortune. I became a permanent fixture there. I felt like part of the family. It was an unfamiliar feeling, but wonderful. The sound of Leo practicing his acoustic guitar in his bedroom. The enticing smells emanating from the kitchen, where a gothy performed her magic. And, in the living room, Lana and me, talking or playing cards or backgammon. How mundane, I hear you say. How trivial. Perhaps. I don't deny it. Domesticity is a peculiarly British trait. Never let it be said that an Englishman's home is not his castle. All I wanted was to be safe within those walls, with Lana, drawbridge firmly up. I longed for love, whatever that means, all my life. I longed for another human being to see me, accept me, care for me. But when I was a young man, I was so invested in this fake person I wanted to be, this false self. I simply wasn't capable of engaging in a relationship with another human being. I never let anyone get close enough. I was always acting, and any affection I received felt curiously unsatisfying. It was for a performance, not for me. These are the mad hoops damaged people jump through, so desperate to receive love. But when it is given to us, it can't be felt. This is because we don't need love for an artificial creation, a mask. What we need, what we desperately long for, is love for the only thing we will never show anyone, the ugly, scared kid inside. But with Lana, it was different. I showed the kid to her. Or, at least, I let her glimpse him. Chapter 7 My therapist used to sometimes quote that famous line from The Wizard of Oz. You know the bit. It's where the scarecrow, confronted by the dark and frightening haunted forest, says, Of course, I don't know, but I think it'll get darker before it gets lighter. Mariana meant this metaphorically, referring to the process of therapy. She was right. Things do get darker before they get lighter, before the therapeutic dawn. Funnily enough, as an aside, I have a pet theory that everyone in life corresponds to one of the characters in The Wizard of Oz. There's Dorothy Gale, a lost child looking for a place to belong, an insecure, neurotic scarecrow seeking intellectual validation, a bullying lion, really a coward, more afraid than anyone else, and the Tin Man, minus a heart. For years, I thought I was a Tin Man. I believed I was missing something vital inside, a heart or the ability to love. Love was out there somewhere beyond me in the dark. I spent my life groping for it until I met Lana. She showed me I already had a heart. I just didn't know how to use it. But then, if I wasn't the Tin Man, who was I? To my dismay, I realized I must be the Wizard of Oz himself. I was an illusion, a conjuring trick, operated by a frightened man, cowering behind a curtain. Who are you, I wonder? Ask yourself this honestly, and you might be surprised at the answer. But will you be honest? That's the real question, I think. A frightened child is hiding inside your mind, still unsafe, still unheard and unloved. The night I heard Mariana utter those words, my life changed forever. For years, I had pretended my childhood didn't happen. I had erased it from my memory, or thought I had, and I lost sight of the kid. Until that foggy January evening in London, when Mariana found him for me again. After that therapy session, I went for a long walk. It was bitterly cold. The sky was white and the clouds heavy. It looked like it might snow. I walked all the way from Primrose Hill to Lana's house in Mayfair. 
I needed to burn off nervous energy. I needed to think about me and the kid trapped in my head. I pictured him, small and afraid, shivering, languishing, undeveloped, undernourished, chained up in the dungeon of my mind. As I walked, all kinds of memories started coming back to me. All these injustices, the cruelties I had deliberately forgotten, all the things he endured. I made a promise to the kid there and then. A pledge, a commitment, call it what you will. From now on, I would listen to him. I would look after him. He wasn't ugly or stupid or worthless or unloved. He was loved for Christ's sake. I loved him. From now on, I would be the parent he needed. Too late, I know, but better late than ever. And this time, I'd bring him up properly. As I walked, I glanced down, and there he was, the little boy, walking by my side. He was struggling to keep up, so I slowed down. I reached out and held his hand. It's okay, I whispered. Everything's okay now. I'm here. You're safe. I promise. I arrived at Lana's house, shivering with cold, just as it started to snow. No one was home but Lana. We sat by the fire, drinking whiskey, watching the snow fall outside. I told her about my, I don't know what the right word is, epiphany, shall we call it? It took me a while to explain it all to her. As I spoke, I struggled with the fear I wouldn't be able to make myself understood, but I needn't have worried. As Lana listened, and the snow fell, it was the first time I ever saw her cry. We both cried that night. I told her all my secrets, almost all, and Lana told me hers. All the dark secrets we were both so ashamed of, all the horrors we believed had to be kept hidden, they all came tumbling out that night, with no shame, no judgment, no self-consciousness, just openness, just truth. It felt like the first real conversation I've ever had with another human being. I don't know how to describe it. For the first time, I felt alive. Not performing at life, you understand. Not pretending. Not faking it. Not almost living. But just living. This was also the first time I glimpsed the other Lana, the secret person she kept hidden from the world, and whom I had not wanted to find. Now I discovered her, in all her naked vulnerability, as I heard the truth about her childhood, about that sad, lonely girl, and the terrible things that happened to her. I heard the truth about Otto and the frightening years of their marriage. It seemed he was just one in a long line of men to treat her badly. I swore to myself that I would be different. I'd be the exception. I'd protect Lana, cherish her, love her. I'd never betray her. I'd never let her down. I reached out across the couch and squeezed her hand. I love you, I said. I love you too. Our words hung in the air like smoke. I leaned forward, still holding onto her hand, as, ever so slowly, staring into her eyes, I inched closer and closer until our faces met. My lips were against hers. I kissed her gently on the lips. It was the sweetest kiss I'd ever known. So innocent, so tender, so full of love. Over the next few days, I spent a lot of time thinking about that kiss and what it meant. It seemed like a final acknowledgement of the long-standing tension between us, the fulfillment of an ancient unspoken promise. It was, as Mr. Valentine Levy might have put it, the conclusion of a deeply cherished goal on my part. And what was that goal? To be loved, of course. I finally felt loved. Lana and I were meant to be together. This was clear to me now. This was deeper than anything I ever had imagined. This was my destiny. Chapter 8 I'm going to tell you something I've never told anyone. I was going to ask Lana to marry me. I understood now, you see, that's where we had been heading all this time, drifting, slowly but surely, into romantic territory. Maybe not great flames of passion, which, by the way, blow cold as fast as they blow hot. I mean a slow, steady-burning ember of true, deep affection and mutual respect. That's what lasts. That's love. Lana and I were now spending almost every second of the day together. The next step, it seemed to me, the logical progression, was for me to move out of Barbara West's house and to move in with Lana, for us to get married and live happily ever after. What's wrong with that? If you had a child, you'd want that for him, wouldn't you? To live in a world of beauty, prosperity, safety. To be happy, secured, and loved. Why is it wrong for me to want that for myself? 
I would have made a good husband. Talking of husbands, I've seen plenty of photos of Otto, and he was no oil painting either, believe me. Yes, I stand by my claim. Despite the discrepancy in our appearances and our bank balances, Lana and I made a great couple. Not sexy or glamorous, perhaps, like her and Jason, but less self-conscious and more content, like two kids, happy as clams. I decided to proceed formally, as you might in an old-fashioned movie. I felt some kind of romantic declaration would be appropriate, a confession of my feelings, the story of a friendship turned to love, that kind of thing. I practiced a little speech, concluding in a marriage proposal. I even bought a ring, a cheap thing, admittedly, a plain silver band. It was the best I could afford. My intention was to replace it with something more valuable one day, when my ship came in. But even though it was just a prop, as a symbol of my affection, that ring was as meaningful or significant as any island Otto might buy her. One Friday evening, with the engagement ring in my pocket, I went to meet Lana at a gallery opening on the south bank. My plan was to sneak her onto the roof, under the stars, and propose above the Thames. What could be a more appropriate backdrop? given all our long walks along the river. But when I arrived at the gallery, Lana wasn't there. Kate was, though, holding court at the bar. Hello, she said, giving me a funny look. I didn't know you were coming. Where's Lana? I was about to ask you the same question. She's late, as usual. Kate gestured at the tall man standing next to her. Meet my new fella. Isn't he devilishly handsome? Jason, this is Elliot. Just then, Lana arrived. She came over and was introduced to Jason. And then, well, you know the rest. Lana acted completely out of character that night. She was all over Jason, flirting shamelessly with him. She threw herself at him. And she was being so weird with me, so cold and dismissive. She rebuffed all my attempts to talk to her, as if I didn't exist. I left the gallery feeling confused and dejected. The cold, hard ring was in my pocket, and I turned it over and over in my fingers. I found myself giving in to a familiar feeling of despair, a feeling of inevitability. I could hear the kids sobbing in my head. Of course, of course she didn't want you. She's embarrassed by you. You're not good enough for her, can't you see that? She regretted kissing you, and tonight was her way of putting you in your place. Fair enough, I thought. Perhaps it was true. Perhaps I never stood a chance with Lana. Unlike Jason, I was no practice seducer, except of old women, apparently. My jailer was waiting for me when I got back to the house. She had been writing all evening and was now relaxing with a large scotch in the living room. Well, how was it? Barbara poured herself another drink. Fill me in on all the gossip. I want a full report. No gossip. Very dull. Oh, come on. Something must have happened. I've been working hard all day, earning our daily bread. At least you can entertain me a little before bed. I was in no mood to indulge her and remain monosyllabic. Barbara can sense my unhappiness. And, like a true predator, couldn't resist going in for the kill. What's the matter, dear? She peered at me. Nothing. You're being very quiet. Is something wrong? Nothing. Are you sure? Tell me about it. What is it? You wouldn't understand. Oh, I bet I can guess. Suddenly, Barbara laughed full of glee, like an impish child delighting in a mean prank. I felt unaccountably nervous. What's so funny? It's a private joke. You wouldn't understand. I knew better than to react. She was trying to provoke me, but there was no point in getting into a fight with Barbara. I have learned from bitter experience that you never win an argument with a narcissist. It doesn't work like that. Your only victory is to leave. I'm going to bed. Wait, she downed her drink. Help me upstairs. Barbara walked with a stick by then, which made climbing stairs difficult. I supported her with one arm. She held onto the banister with the other hand. We slowly made our way upstairs. By the way, Barbara said, I saw your chum today, Lana. We had tea and a nice cozy chat. Did you? That didn't make sense. They weren't friends. Where was that? Lana's house, naturally. My, my, isn't it grand? I had no idea you were so ambitious, Duck. Mustn't set your sights too high. Remember what happened to Icarus. Icarus? I laughed. What are you on about? How many whiskeys have you had? Barbara grinned, showing her teeth. Oh, you're right to be scared. I would be, too, if I were you. 
I had to put a stop to it, you see. We reached the top of the stairs. Barbara let go of my arm as I handed her stick back to her. I tried to sound amused. A stop to what? To you, duck. I had to put the poor girl straight. She doesn't deserve you. Few do. I stared at her, feeling frightened. Barbara, what have you done? She laughed, delighting in my distress. As she spoke, she hammered her stick on the floorboards, underscoring the rhythm of her speech. She was clearly relishing every word. I told her all about you, Barbara said. I told her your real name. I told her what you were when I found you. I told her I've had you followed, that I know what you get up to in the afternoons, and the rest. I told her you're dangerous, a liar, a sociopath, and you're after her money, like you're after mine. I told her I caught you messing about with my medication not once, but twice, recently. If anything should happen to me in the near future, Lana, I said, you mustn't be surprised. Barbara drummed her stick on the floor as she laughed. The poor girl was horrified. Do you know what she said? If all this is true, she cried, how can you bear to live with him in the same house? I spoke in a low voice, flat, expressionless. I felt strangely tired. And what did you say? Barbara drew herself up and spoke with dignity. I simply reminded Lana that I am a writer. I keep him around, I said, not out of pity or affection, but to study, as an object of repulsive fascination, very much as one might keep a reptile in a cage. She laughed and pounded her stick on the floor repeatedly, as if applauding her witticism. I didn't say anything. But let me tell you, I hated Barbara in that moment. I hated her so much, I could have killed her. It would be so easy, I thought, to kick that stick of hers and knock her off balance. Then, just the lightest of touches would send her falling backward down the stairs, her body thumping down the steps, one by one, all the way to the bottom, until her neck broke with a crack on the marble floor. Chapter 9 You'd be forgiven for thinking, after everything Barbara West told her about me, that Lana would never speak to me again. Friendships had foundered on less. Thankfully, Lana was made of strong stuff. I imagine how she reacted to Barbara's character assassination, that cruel attempt to discredit me in her eyes and destroy our friendship. Barbara, Lana said, the majority of what you said about Elliot is untrue. The rest I already knew. He is my friend, and I love him. Now get out of my house. That's how I like to picture it, anyway. The truth is, there was a definite coolness between Lana and me after that. It was made worse because we never spoke about it, not once. I only had Barbara's word for it that the conversation had ever taken place. Can you believe it? Lana never mentioned it. I often thought about bringing it up, forcing her to confront it. I never did. But I hated that there were secrets between us now, subjects to be avoided. We, who had shared so much. Mercifully, Barbara West died soon afterward. No doubt, the universe sighed with relief at her passing. I certainly did. Almost immediately, Lana started calling me again, and our friendship resumed. It seemed as if Lana had decided to bury Barbara's poisonous words along with the old witch herself. But it was too late for me and Lana by then. Too late for us. By then, Jason and Lana had embarked on their whirlwind romance, as the Daily Mail breathlessly called it. They were married a few months later. Sitting in the church, watching the wedding ceremony, I was keenly aware I wasn't the only guest with a broken heart. Kate was sitting right next to me, tearful, and more than a little inebriated. I was impressed she had brazened it out, in true Kate style, and attended the wedding, head held high, despite having ignominiously lost her lover to her best friend. Perhaps she shouldn't have gone. Perhaps what Kate should have done, for the sake of her mental health, and this goes for me too, was to pull away and distance herself from Lana and Jason. But Kate couldn't do that. She loved them too much to give either of them up. That's the truth. And after Lana married Jason, Kate tried to bury her feelings for Jason and put the past behind her. Whether she succeeded is open to question. Chapter 10 I may as well come clean. I had known about Kate and Jason's affair for quite some time. I discovered it by chance. It was a Thursday afternoon. I happened to be in Soho for, well, let's call it an appointment and I was a little early, so I thought I'd pop into a pub for a quick drink. As I turned onto Greek Street, guess who I saw emerging from the coach and horses? Kate was exiting the pub, 
looking rather furtive, glancing from left to right. I was about to call out her name when Jason emerged just behind her with that same sheepish look. I watched them from across the street. They could have seen me, either of them, if they had looked up, but they didn't. They kept their heads low, parting without a word to each other. They hurried off in opposite directions. Hello, I thought. What's going on here? What odd behavior, not to mention informative. It told me something I hadn't known before, that Jason and Kate were meeting independently of Lana. Did Lana know about this, I wondered. I made a mental note to ponder this further, and think how I might best use it to my advantage. I hadn't given up hope, you see. I still loved Lana. I still believed that one day we would be married. There was no question about that in my mind. Obviously, she was now married to Jason, which made things trickier. But my goal, as Mr. Levy would say, remained the same. When Lana and Jason got married, I assumed, like everyone else, it wouldn't last. I thought after a few months of being married to a bore like Jason, Lana would come to her senses. She would wake up to what a terrible mistake she had made, and she would see me there, waiting for her. Compared to Jason, I'd appear as suave and sophisticated as Cary Grant in an old movie, reclining against a piano, cigarette in one hand, martini in the other, witty, self-effacing, warm, lovable, and just like Cary, I'd get the girl in the end. But to my astonishment, their marriage endured, month after month, year upon year. It was torture for me. No doubt it was Lana's sheer loveliness that kept it going. Jason would have tried a saint's patience, and Lana was clearly something more than a saint. A martyr, perhaps? Therefore, as far as I was concerned, this surprise encounter with Kate and Jason in Soho was nothing short of a divine intervention. I had to make the most of it. I decided it would be a good idea if I started following Kate, which makes it sound more cloak and dagger than it was. You didn't need to be George Smiley to spy on Kate Crosby. She wasn't inconspicuous. You didn't lose her in a crowd, whereas I always meld into the background. Kate was appearing in a successful revival of Radigan's Deep Blue Sea, which had transferred to the Prince Edward Theatre in Soho. So, it was just a matter of lurking across the street from the stage door, watching from the shadows, waiting for the play to finish, and Kate to emerge and sign autographs for the crowd of fans. Then, when Kate left and made her way along the street, I followed. I didn't have to follow far, just from stage door to pub door. Kate walked around the corner and slipped in through the side door of, yes, you guessed it, the coach and horses. Peering through one of the pub's narrow windows, I saw Jason waiting for her at a corner table with a couple of drinks. Kate greeted him with a long kiss. I was shocked, not so much by the revelation that they were lovers, which, to be frank, had a kind of sordid inevitability to it, but by their total unbelievable lack of discretion. They were all over each other that night, drunker and messier as the evening wore on. They were so oblivious of their surroundings, I felt secure enough to leave the window and venture inside the pub. I sat at the other end of the bar, ordered a vodka tonic, and watched the proceedings from there. Appropriately enough, some old dear was sitting at the upright piano, belting out the chorus of, If love were all, by Noel Coward. I believe the more you love a man, the more you give your trust, the more you're bound to lose. When they finally left the pub, I followed. I watched them kissing in an alley for a moment. Then, having seen enough, I hopped in a cab and went home. Chapter 11 From then on, I kept a detailed record in my notebook of everything I saw. All the dates, times, locations of their clandestine meetings. I wrote it all down. I had a feeling it might come in useful later on. Often, during my surveillance, I would ponder the precise nature of Kate and Jason's affair what they got out of it, apart from the obvious, and why they were so intent on pursuing a course that, to me, seemed destined for disaster. Sometimes, I would apply Valentine Levy's system to their affair, breaking it down in terms of motivation, intention, and goal. As usual, motivation was key. Presumably, Jason's motive for embarking on the affair had to do with boredom, sexual attraction, or selfishness. Maybe that's unkind. If I were being generous, I might say Jason found Kate easier to talk to. Lana was wonderful, but her habit of always seeing the best in you made you determine to rise to that challenge. Kate, on the other hand, was far more cynical in her view of human nature, and therefore much easier to confide in, 
Not that Jason was entirely honest with her, either. But, truthfully, I believe the real reason for Jason's infidelity lay in the darkest of places. He liked to think he was powerful. He was competitive and aggressive. He couldn't even lose a game of backgammon without flying off the handle, for God's sake. So what happens when a man like that marries a woman like Lana? A woman who is infinitely more powerful in every regard. Might he not want to punish that woman? To crush her? Break her? And call it love? His affair with Kate was an act of revenge on Jason's part. An act of hatred, not love. Kate's motive for pursuing the affair was quite different. It reminds me of what Barbara West used to say. That emotional betrayal is much worse than sexual infidelity. Screw another woman, fine, she would say. But take her out for dinner, hold her hand, tell her your hopes and dreams. Then you've screwed me. And that's precisely what Kate wanted from Jason. Dinner conversations and held hands and passionate romance. A love affair. Kate wanted Jason to leave Lana and be with her. Kate kept pressing him on this. Jason kept putting her off. Who could blame him? He had far too much to lose. Late one night, I followed Kate to a bar in Chinatown. She met a friend there, a redhead called Polly. They sat by the window and talked. I stood across the street, lurking in the shadows. I needn't have worried about them seeing me. Polly and Kate were engrossed in an animated conversation. At one point, Kate was in tears. I didn't need to be able to lip-read to work out what was being said. I knew Polly quite well. She was Gordon's stage manager, and they had been involved in a lengthy affair. Everyone knew about it, except Gordon's wife. Polly was a troubled person in many ways, but I liked her. She was outspoken and direct, so I could imagine how her conversation with Kate played out. Kate confided in her no doubt hoping for a sympathetic ear. From where I was standing, it didn't look like she was getting one. End it, Polly was saying. End it now. What? Kate, listen to me. If he doesn't leave his wife now, then he never will. It will just drag on and on. Give him an ultimatum. Thirty days to leave her. One month, or you end it. Promise me. I suspect these words grew to haunt Kate, because thirty days came and went, and she didn't follow Polly's advice. As time passed, the reality of what Kate was doing started sinking in. Her conscience began to plague her. This shouldn't come as a surprise. Unless I have spectacularly bungled my job, it should be abundantly clear that, despite her many faults, Kate was fundamentally a good person, with a conscience and a heart. This prolonged betrayal of her oldest friend, the heinous cruelty of it, began to torment Kate. Her guilt grew, obsessing her, until she became fixated on clearing the air as she put it. She wanted to have it out with Lana and Jason, a frank and open conversation among the three of them, which, needless to say, Jason was determined to prevent. Personally, I think Kate's intention was naive at best. God only knows what she imagined would happen. A confession, followed by tears, then forgiveness and reconciliation? Did she really think Lana would give them her blessing? That it would all end happily? Kate should have known better. Life doesn't work like that. In the end, it seems that Kate, too, was a romantic, and that is precisely what she and Lana, so different in every other regard, had in common. They both believed in love, which, as you shall see, proved their downfall. Chapter 12 Considering how indiscreet Kate and Jason were being, I knew it couldn't be the only one who knew about their affair. The theater world in London is not large. Gossip about the two had to be rife. Surely, it would only be a matter of time before it filtered back to Lana? Not necessarily, for all her fame and her immersive walks around London. Lana lived a quiet life. Her social circle was small. I suspected only one person in that circle knew the truth, or had at least guessed it, a gothy, and she would never breathe a word. No, it fell to me to break the bad news to Lana. Not an enviable tax, but how to do it? One thing was clear. Lana must not hear the news from me directly. She might question my motives. She might decide to be suspicious and refuse to believe me. That would be catastrophic. No, I must be entirely independent of this unsavory business. Only then could I appear as her savior. Her deus ex machina in shining armor to rescue her and carry her off in my arms. Somehow, I had to engineer Lana's discovery of the affair invisibly, undetectably making her believe she had discovered it all by herself. 
Easier said than done, I know, but I've always enjoyed a challenge. I began with the simplest and most direct approach. I tried to contrive a coincidental, accidental meeting, where Lana and I would bump into the guilty pair unexpectedly, in flagrante delicto, as it were. There followed a period of high comedy, or low farce, depending on your taste, as I attempted to maneuver Lana into Soho on various pretexts. But this was a hopeless effort, and, in the best tradition of farces, went nowhere fast. The obvious reason was that it was impossible to maneuver Lana Farr anywhere inconspicuously. The one time I managed to coax her into the coach and horses, just as Kate's play was finishing, Lana's arrival caused a mini-riot of jovial drunks surrounding her, begging her to autograph their beer mats. If Kate and Jason had even neared the pub, they would have seen this whole circus long before we ever saw them. I was forced to grow bolder in my methods. I began dropping comments into our conversations carefully rehearsed phrases that I hoped would register and linger with Lana. Isn't it funny how Jason and Kate have exactly the same sense of humor? They're always laughing together. Or else, I wonder why Kate isn't dating anyone. It has been a while, hasn't it? And one afternoon, I told Lana off for not inviting me for lunch at Claridge's. Then, when it was obvious that Lana had no idea what I meant, I looked flustered, brushing it off, saying Gordon saw Kate and Jason eating there, and I assumed Lana was with them but Gordon must have been wrong. Lana just gazed at me with those clear blue eyes, unfazed, free of all suspicion, and smiled. It couldn't possibly be Jason. He hates Claridge's. In a play, all my little hints would have stayed with Lana, creating a general subliminal patina of suspicion, impossible for her to ignore. But what works on stage doesn't, apparently, work in real life. Even so, I persevered. I am nothing if not persistent if occasionally absurd. For instance, I bought a bottle of Kate's perfume, a distinctive floral scent with hints of jasmine and rose. If that didn't make Lana think of Kate, nothing would. I kept the bottle in my pocket, and whenever I was in the house, I would pretend I was going to the bathroom, and sprint along the corridor to their laundry room to liberally spray Jason's shirts with a perfume. How much direct contact Lana ever had with Jason's laundry was open to question, but even if Agathe smelled it, I made the connection, I thought, that might help. I stole a few long hairs from Kate's coat when we were both at Lana's for dinner, then attached them carefully to Jason's jacket. I toyed with the idea of leaving condoms in Jason's wash bag, but decided against it, as it felt too obvious. It was hard to get the balance right. Too subtle a hint, and it went undetected. Too much, and I'd give the game away. The earring proved just right, and so simple to engineer. I had no idea it would work so well or provoke the reaction it did. All I did was suggest Lana and I pay a surprise visit to Kate's house, and I stole an earring from Kate's bedroom, which I then pinned to Jason's suit lapel, back at Lana's house. Lana did the rest herself, with a little help from Agathe, and Sid, the dry cleaner. That Lana reacted so violently to the earring suggests she already secretly suspected the affair, don't you think? She just didn't want to admit it to herself. Well, now she had no choice. Chapter 13 This brings us neatly back to that night in my flat, the night Lana came over distraught, having found the earring. She sat across from me in the armchair, red-eyed, tear-stained, vodka-soaked. She told me about her suspicions that Jason and Kate were sleeping together. I confirmed her fears, saying I suspected it too. I was feeling triumphant. My plan had worked. It was hard to conceal my excitement. It took an effort not to smile. But my elation was short-lived. When I tactfully suggested that Lana would now be leaving Jason, she looked mystified. Leaving him? Who said anything about leaving him? Now it was my turn to look mystified. I don't see what other option you have. It's not so simple, Elliot. Why not? Lana looked at me eyes full of baffled tears, as if the answer were blindingly obvious. I love him, she said. I couldn't believe it. Staring at her, I realized to my increasing horror that all my efforts had been in vain. Lana wasn't going to leave him. I love him. I had a sick feeling in my stomach, as if I were going to throw up. I had been wasting my time. Lana's words crushed all my hopes. She wasn't going to leave him. I love him. I clenched my hand into a fist. I never felt so angry before. I wanted to hit her. I wanted to punch her. 
I felt like screaming, but I didn't. I sat there, looking sympathetic, and we continued talking. The only outward sign of my distress was the clenched fist by my side. The whole time we talked, my mind was racing. I understood my mistake now. Unlike her husband, Lana clearly meant her vows. Until death do us part. Lana might well cut Kate out of her life, but she wasn't about to relinquish Jason. She would forgive him. It would take more than the revelation of an affair to end their marriage. If I wanted to get rid of Jason, I had to go much further. I had to destroy him. Finally, Lana drank herself into oblivion and passed out on my couch. I went to the kitchen to make a cup of tea and to think. While I waited for the kettle to boil, I daydreamed about sneaking up behind Jason, armed with one of his own guns, pointing it at him, and blowing his brains out. I felt a sudden rush of excitement as I imagined this, a weird, perverse feeling of pride, the way you would feel standing up to a bully, which is exactly what Jason was. Unfortunately, it was just a fantasy. I'd never go through with it. I knew I'd never get away with it. I had to think of something cleverer than that. But what? Our motivation is to remove pain, Mr. Valentine Levy said. He was right. I had to take action. Otherwise, I'd never be free of this pain. I was in such pain. Believe me, I felt so close to despair. Standing there in the kitchen at 3 a.m., I felt thwarted, vanquished. But no, not entirely vanquished. For thinking about Mr. Levy had sparked an association in my mind, the beginnings of an idea. If this were a play, I suddenly thought, what would I do? Yes, what if I were to approach my dilemma in those terms, as if I were staging a theatrical work, a drama? If this were a play I was writing, and these were my characters, I'd use my knowledge of them to predict their actions, and provoke their reactions, to shape their destiny without them knowing it. Could I not, similarly, in real life, contrive a series of events that would, without me lifting a finger, end in Jason's death? Why not? Yes, it was risky and might well fail, but that element of danger is what live theater is all about, isn't it? My only hesitation in this was Lana. I didn't want to lie to her, but I decided, and judge me harshly for this if you like, that it was for her own good. After all, what was I doing? Nothing but freeing the woman I loved from a faithless, dishonest criminal, and replacing him with a decent, honest man. She would be so much better off without him. She would be with me. I sat down at my desk. I switched on the green lamp. I pulled out my notebook from the top drawer. I opened it and turned to a fresh page. I reached for a pencil, sharpened it, and I began to plot it out. As I wrote, I could sense Heraclitus standing above me, watching over my shoulder, nodding with approval. For even though my plan went so wrong, even though it ended in such disaster, there, in the designing of the plot, in its conception, it was beautiful. That's my story in a nutshell. A tale of a beautiful, well-intentioned failure ending in death. Which is a pretty good metaphor for life, isn't it? Well, my life, anyway. There we have it. I'm aware this has been a lengthy aside. It is, however, integral to my narrative. But that's not up to me, is it? It's what you think that counts. And you don't say anything, do you? You just sit there, listening, silently judging. I'm conscious of your judgment. I don't want to bore you or lose your interest. Not when you've given me so much of your time already. Which reminds me of something Tennessee Williams used to say his writing advice to aspiring dramatists. Don't be boring, baby, he'd say. Do whatever it takes to keep the thing going. Blow up a bomb on stage if you have to. But don't be boring. Okay, baby, so here comes that bomb. Chapter 14 Let us return to the island and the night of the murder. Just after midnight, there were three gunshots in the ruin. A few minutes afterward, we all arrived at the clearing. A chaotic scene followed as I tried to take Lana's pulse and to disentangle her from Leo's arms. Jason gave Agathe his phone to call an ambulance and the police. Jason went back to the house to get a gun. He was followed by Kate, then Leo. Agathe and I were alone. This much you know. What you don't know is what happened next. Agathe was in shock. She gone completely pale, like she might faint. Remembering the phone in her hand, she lifted it up to call the police. No, I stopped her. Not yet. What? Agathe looked at me blankly. Wait. 
Agathi looked confused. Then she looked at Lana's body. For a split second, did Agathi think of her grandmother and wish she were here now? And that old witch would shut her eyes and sway and mutter an incantation, an ancient magical spell to resurrect Lana, to make her live again and return from death? Lana, please, Agathi prayed silently. Please be alive. Please live. Live. Then, as in a dream or a nightmare, or on hallucinatory drugs, reality began to distort itself at Agathi's command, and Lana's body began to move. Chapter 15 One of Lana's limbs twitched ever so slightly of its own accord. The blue eyes opened, and her body began to sit up. Agathi went to scream. I grabbed hold of her. Shh! I whispered, shh, it's okay, it's okay. Agathi squirmed and threw me off. She seemed about to lose her balance, but she managed to stay upright, unsteadily, breathing hard. Agathi, I said, listen, it's okay, it's a game, that's all, a play. We're acting, see? Agathi slowly, fearfully moved her eyes past me. She looked over my shoulder at Lana's body. The dead woman was now on her feet, holding out her arms for an embrace. Agathi said the voice she thought she'd never hear again. Darling, come here. Lana wasn't dead. Judging by the sparkle in her eyes, she never felt more alive. Agathi was overcome with emotion. She wanted to fall into Lana's arms, sob with joy and relief, hold Lana tight. But she didn't. Instead, she found herself staring at Lana with increasing anger. A game? Agathi, listen. What kind of game? I can explain, said Lana. Not now, I said. There isn't time. We'll explain later. Right now, we need you to play along. Agathi's eyes welled up with tears. She shook her head, unable to bear it any longer. She turned and marched off, disappearing in the trees. Wait, Lana called after her. Agathi! Shh, keep quiet, I said. I'll deal with it. I'll talk to her. Lana looked doubtful. I could tell her resolve was wavering. I tried again, more forcefully. Lana, please don't. You'll ruin everything. Lana! Lana ignored me. She ran after Agathi into the olive grove. I watched her go, aghast. I don't know if I'm saying this with the benefit of hindsight, or if I had some inkling of it at the time, but at this precise moment, my perfect plan began to unravel, and everything went to hell. Chapter 16 